Over the last couple of weeks on this channel, we have been exploring certain mysteries around islands. We started with the island of Bermeja, then we moved to Bannerman Island, and then we moved to Floating Eye Island. Before the Great Awakening, these stories would have been brain scratchers. Fun mysteries that for most of us, we probably thought would never be solved. But during this Great Awakening, what we're finding is some of these mysterious islands have a much larger story. And instead of the story providing us with answers, they're providing us with even more questions. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our producers and our patrons here on Esoteric Atlanta. If you would like to become a part of our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta, my name is Bryce, and today on Mystery Monday, we are gonna be talking about Earthquake Island. Earthquake islands or islands that appear because of an earthquake are not uncommon. That in itself is not a mystery. In fact, there are multiple islands all over the world that are the result of said earthquakes. These islands are also considered to be mud islands. Because when they come up from the earthquake, it's not like they come up hosting life. They come up basically as the floor of the sea. And on the 24th of September, 2013, an earthquake with the magnitude of 7.7 .7 erupted in Pakistan. This earthquake ended up killing 350 people and left about 100,000 people homeless. In any situation, this would have been devastating. But in a country like Pakistan, where there's already a lot of poverty, this earthquake added more devastation. Now, this particular island that appeared after the earthquake in Pakistan in 2013 appeared about 1.2 miles from the coast of the port city of Gwadar. Because of its close proximity to the coast, many of the citizens of Gwadar could see this new island. Upon examining the island, it appeared that there were gases coming off the island. In fact, one person lit a match and a fire broke out in the area where he lit the match. So needless to say, this island probably wasn't the safest land there was. However, many of the locals used the island because it did provide a good access point for fishing. However, the island then would go on to disappear again in 2016. Now, as I said, the whole concept of a mud island or an earthquake island is not that much of a mystery to us today. However, when I looked deeper into Gwadar, I discovered a much bigger story that might or might not have to do with the earthquake that happened in Pakistan. Throughout the course of history, human beings have strived to find more and more and more and more better technology. We now are aware that throughout our history, there have been times, perhaps, where human beings had an even more sophisticated way of living than we do today. For those that believe in the concept of Atlantis, we know that the people that lived in Atlantis were even more tech savvy than we are. I personally do believe that Atlantis existed. I believe it existed on a different timeline though. And where we see the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is the start of a new timeline. We know from sources like the Bible and missing and banned books of the Bible that right before Noah's flood, we were once again at a very tech savvy place in our existence, perhaps even more savvy than we are now with our iPhones and YouTube. And then when the flood happened, all that was washed away yet again. As we've come into this great awakening and the veil has been lifted, we now understand that the powers that be are light years ahead of the average citizen when it comes to their use of science and technology. One of the hardest things for me to accept has been the idea of weather manipulation. Although we do know from a past video that the definition of being a light worker is somebody that works with nature, with the ebb and the flow 
of God's ordained rhythm. However, somebody that works in witchcraft is somebody that works against nature, trying to manipulate nature to do that person's bidding. And we do know that the powers that be often participate in witchcraft. Now again, as we get into the story of Earthquake Island and Gwadar, I have no concrete proof for any of the connections between the political goings-on in Gwadar and this particular island. For me, it is merely speculation and speculation that I probably won't have answers to for a very, very long time. But at the end of the video, I would also love to hear your speculations on this phenomenon. So the city of Gwadar is considered to be the crown jewel of Pakistan. Now, as I said about our videos over Argentina, this is not a video about the people of Pakistan. I personally believe that majority of the people in each country are beautiful, loving, and good people. Once more, we're talking about a very small group of elite, evil, evil people that care nothing about the country they have been sworn in to protect and more about preserving their little group. The name Gwadar means the gate of the wind. Again, it is a port city in the southwestern coast of Pakistan along the Arabian Sea, opposite of Oman. Now, Oman owned Gwadar from 1783 to 1958. Now, in the future, I would love to do a video specifically over Oman because, wow, what an interesting story this country has. We know that Thomas, the Apostle Thomas, traveled through Oman to get to India after the crucifixion of Jesus. In fact, the original name of Oman was Magan, which means the land of frankincense. Oman itself is on the southeastern coast of the Arabian Peninsula, and it is the oldest independent state in the Arab world. For most of the history of Oman, its economy was based off of fishing. However, in the 16th century, Oman was colonized by the Portuguese which ended in a lot of battles and violence for the people. In 1962, oil was found in Oman. And whenever there's oil found, wealth, strife, and violence are sure to follow. In 1958, the city of Gwadar was purchased from Oman by the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Pakistan paid Oman what would be about $2 billion in today's currency for this particular town. Immediately after the purchase was complete, Pakistan sent its navy down to Gwadar. One of the saddest things about Pakistan itself is its poverty. Poverty should never happen anywhere in the world. And hopefully with the new common law coming into place, we will see the eradication of said poverty. Pakistan, like many other poor countries, has a lot of natural resources natural resources that should be used by the people of the area. However, as we know, these natural resources are often monopolized by the elite globalists. It is believed that human beings first appeared in the area known as Pakistan around 73,000 years ago. Around 7,000 BC, we see the beginning of farming and agriculture around this region. In 4,500 BC, we see civilization around the Indus River Valley. This was a very, very fertile valley. I have a lot of knowledge about the Indus River Valley from my yoga studies because a lot of the Vedics and the philosophies of yoga originated from the people living in this area. It is believed that the very first wheel was used used in this area in a bull cart. And this makes sense because the Indus River Valley became a great area of trade between the Middle East and the Far East. But eventually drought hit the area and many of the civilizations in the Indus River Valley had to migrate. Again, this is where we see the emergence of a lot of the Vedic texts you will find in traditional yoga schools. Around 516 BC, King Darius I, or Darius the Great, invaded the Indus River Valley. For those that grew up in a Christian household, you might recognize that name from the book of Daniel. King Darius the Great was a third of what we now know as the Iranian kings, and his title was King of Kings. This was also given to the first Iranian king, Cyrus the Great again, another historical and biblical figure. 
Now this was super interesting to me. So on Friday's show, we're gonna take a deeper look at King Darius the Great. Before the Indus River Valley, this was the time where we saw a bureaucracy system set up around the area. For all intent and purposes, as much as of a questionable character Darius might be, he seemed to bring a lot of prosperity to the lands that he conquered. In 328 BC, Alexander the Great then conquered the area. Alexander the Great died in 323 BC, and after Alexander died, his land was divided up between a lot of his generals. For those that have been on this channel for a really long time, you might remember us talking about that with Egypt with the Ptolemy line, which is the line of Cleopatra. Ptolemy, the original Ptolemy, was one of Alexander the Great's generals, and he received Egypt once Alexander died and again the land was divided. We know that the Ptolemies had a hold on Egypt for at least a couple hundred years, but that wasn't necessarily the same with the person who had the hold on the Pakistanian area of Alexander the Great's territory. Because soon after the land was divided up, this area was once again invaded. This area became part of the Mara Empire, which ended up collapsing itself in 180 BC. Culturally and historically, during this whole period of time, many Greeks moved into the area still in the area of Pakistan and Afghanistan. That area today, you can still find remains of Greek houses and buildings. We also see a merging of Greek religion and philosophy in with the culture of that region then. This can be known as the Indo-Greek period. And this isn't shocking. This is what happens a lot throughout our history where we see a marriage of different cultures and ideas that end up creating a new culture in itself. We also see in India the rise of the Gupta Empire. And now this Gupta Empire backs up into the Arab Empire and this becomes a very, very important time period in the history of this whole land. This is when the Ramayana was written, for example, a book, again, that we've spoken about on this channel that I have studied a lot in my time in India. Into the modern era, we see the spread of Islam coming into the Middle East. And with it came the Ghaznavid Empire. And this empire ruled the area for a very long time. We still see this empire sharing the Fertile Crescent of the Indus River Valley with India. At this point, the empire known in India was the Delhi Empire. In the 13th and 14th century, Tamar, who was a Mongol, then came in and conquered the whole area. This was also happening in Eastern Europe as well, with the Ottoman Empire eventually taking control of the Byzantine Empire. In the 16th century, and again for two centuries after the 16th century, the Mughal Empire would then go on to control both Pakistan and India. This empire greatly influenced architecture and art in Pakistan that you can still see to this day. But then eventually we see the East India Company coming in from Great Britain to take control of the area. Now, as most people know, in modern times, Pakistan and India have had some heavy, heavy conflicts. And again, as most of you on this channel know, I do spend a lot of time in India especially before the craziness of 2020 happened. And I know for me, I have a 10 year visa to go into India, but when I was getting my visa, I had to go through a lot of questioning about any ties that I might have to Pakistan. Now, obviously I don't have any ties or any family in Pakistan, but I still had to go through this questioning. This is because this issue, this back and forth between India and Pakistan has been going on for a very, very, very long time. Now, once again, I don't believe that the people, the citizens of these countries are responsible for all of this. I do think that this is all just another ploy from the puppet masters because all of the Indian people that I know specifically, and I know a few people from Pakistan here in America as well, are truly lovely people. And I know that they would get anything for this 
conflict between these two countries to subside so the two countries can travel within each other and be friends again. I also want to point out when I'm in India, you do still see a lot of old houses that were built by the British. Now I go to a small town in Karnataka. Most people are familiar with the town of Bangalore, that is, or the city rather of Bangalore, that is the city that I fly into. And then I drive about four hours south to get to the little town of Mysore, where I spend most of my days when I'm in India studying with my teacher. Now within the neighborhoods of Mysore, again, you do see a lot of old British houses that are now obviously owned by Indian families, and they look very similar to the houses, the old antebellum houses that we have down here in the south, except for now, they have a bit of an Indian flair to them. And I think it's really kind of cool to see the history and the present merging together. But nonetheless, on the 14th of August, 1947, Pakistan gained independence from Great Britain. Now, I hope that one day I will be able to travel into the Indus River Valley in Pakistan. I would love to see it. I would love to explore that whole region of the world. It looks beautiful. But I know right now that's not possible, especially since I do spend so much time in India. But again, one of the most exciting things about the future to come is the ability for all of us to be able to explore our planet together. Now, I'm not going to get into all the battles that happened back and forth between India and Pakistan. Most people are aware of everything that happened because we want to get to the present day with Pakistan and what's going on involving Gwadar and particularly this mysterious earthquake island that let off fumes and then disappeared. But in 1956, Pakistan's constitution declared Pakistan to be an Islamic republic. From 1971 to 1977, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto creates an Islamic socialist system in Pakistan. And then in 1977, there was a military coup in Pakistan. Bhutto was arrested and was executed. Now, something interesting that I found in my research over Pakistan is in this time, we see a huge population boom in Pakistan. In 1947, there were about 37 million people living in Pakistan. However, by 2018, there were over 200 million people in Pakistan. That's unbelievable. So once again, in our modern times, we know that Pakistan is a very unstable country. There is a lot of poverty and my heart truly goes out to the people living there that have not had the best of lives because of the circumstances they're in. But what is so strange to me about this again is that this area is full of natural resources. It should not be a poor country. In fact, it should be a very, very, very wealthy country. However, in 2013, the same year as the earthquake that created Earthquake Island, Pakistan announced that it would be doing business with China. This was supposed to be an economic partnership called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPAC for short. This was put out to the public that this would be the new maritime Silk Road. Now, you don't have to be a history buff to know that the Silk Road was a very important trade route for the Middle East. It brought prosperity to towns and villages. So saying that this was going to be the maritime Silk Road was obviously something that the average person was happy to hear. CPAC was going to be a collection of infrastructure projects throughout Pakistan. It would include transportation systems and energy projects. This would also exclusively give China access to the Arabian Sea to better export their products. This also gave China, or rather the CCP, more control over an already devastated area. But going back to when Oman owned the city of Gwadar, back in 1954, four years before Oman would sell Gwadar to Pakistan, the city of Gwadar was noted as being a location of a deep water seaport. And in my opinion, that was what made Pakistan want to purchase the rights to this seaport from Oman. In 2007, Plans were released to build a port that was valued at $248 million. But then in 2015, two years after CPAC 
was announced. And after this earthquake island happened, China would put in $1.62 billion for further development on this port. The port of Gwadar is now owned and operated by both Pakistan and China. In fact, the administrative control is, is governed by the Maritime Secretary of Pakistan, while the operational control is governed by the China Overseas Port Holding Company. Now again, for many people living in Pakistan, this could have meant more economic prosperity. With China investing so much money into the city and providing more jobs, it's safe to say that many people thought their future was going to change. However, what we see now is that the CPAC gives nothing but an illusion of economic prosperity, while the global elites of the world are the ones that are benefiting from all the natural resources. Basically, as always, the money is going to the elite off of the labor of the common man. Now, I speculate that the earthquake that happened in 2013 was not a natural earthquake. I have a feeling that the elite powers that be were trying to figure something out regarding that port. And this mud island just happened to pop up as a result of that. Again, I will remind you, this is the same year that China and Pakistan announced their partnership. So even though earthquake islands are natural phenomenons that happen with earthquakes, again, I don't think the earthquake itself was just a natural act of God. People working against the laws of nature in order to suit their own needs. I can't wait for the day when the people of Pakistan get their country back. So once again, leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. Thank you so much again to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there is a link as always down in the description box below. And thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you all today. I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. No